hopefully we'll have sound in the audio for the recording. Let's see. All right. Sorry for the delayed start. Let's see. So I try and send out announcements before the class starts, like on Monday or so. I neglected to do that because my calendar reminder wasn't in place, but now I do. Uh, let's see. Right. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, in an email, you do have homework feedback. Uh, it should be in Blackboard. Did anybody not see feedback in Blackboard? Okay, yeah. So take a look. Um, and if and if you have some questions or something, and you think when is Ben going to follow up with me, that that will not work out for you. So you have to proactively say, Ben, you graded my homework, you gave this feedback, and I need to talk more. So that. The burden is now on you to talk to me. So I've given you feedback. If you're not happy with it or you don't understand it, or you, you think you gave a good notebook and you got 100%, but you still have questions because you think you can do better, that's totally reasonable, right? You want to improve. I want to help you improve. So uh, just um, ask me for input because I've, I've given you some input now. Right. And then some of you included your the code that you submitted but didn't need created in raw cells, that is a good thing to do. So there's, remember, three types of cells, raw, markdown, and code. Use all three uh, appropriately. OK, so I'm going to go over the homeworks. I will typically do that, um, assuming everyone has submitted homeworks for grading. I try and not show the solutions before people have submitted. So I'm going to go over the uh, solutions now in class. And I will use your homework. So there's, this is just your homework. It's, it's not my solution. It's your solution. So if you see it up here and you're like, that's my homework. Like, Sorry. you can say that. Like, I'm not going to call you out. The mute? So in your shared sessions, the join session. And you can turn off the volume and mute the first speaker. Yes, Blackboard Collaborate. Let's show you where that is. OK, so in Blackboard, in Collaborate, you have a microphone here. This microphone should be off. Mine is on, yours is off. Got it? Right. You gotta click that again. Yeah. I'll keep going with some echo for a little while. I'll allow you to troubleshoot a little bit. Maybe we can turn mine off and see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. Okay. So back to the homework. I'm gonna show you what I saw and comment on it. I'll typically show you homeworks that I think were good or demonstrated some quality worth replicating. So I'm going to show you the thick things. There are plenty of homeworks which had problems. I won't spend as much time on those. Um, so I'm just going to look at the homeworks that you submitted. All right, now that... All right so <laughs> here's the first homework. This had a markdown cell at the top of the notebook. And it uses some formatting. So you're like. Wow, that looks really fancy. How did they get that formatting to show up in their notebook? So let's double click on their notebook. If I can, maybe my notebook won't cooperate today. There we go. So if I double click on it, all they did was they used some HTML tags in their markdown cell, and that allowed them to format the thing that you see here. So that's all that is. Now you're like, wow, look at that table. What happened there? Right, so they, they looked up someone over with this notebook. Again, I'm not calling you off. I'm just saying this is a good example of a notebook where they looked up some how to use markdown cells to create a table. They just put in these uh, horizontal bars and that got them the table. So just you know, fun things you can do in markdown cells. Okay. Not required, obviously, just sort of like a pretty formatting thing that they were playing around with. Okay. So now other good things to comment on this notebook, they used both markdown cells, and they had inline comments. So these hashtag and then whatever, that, that character is not going to be interpreted by Python. Um, so it's just a way of sort of like citing your work, which is also a good tactic. And I'm not going to walk through the code itself, but um, typically people use you know, between 10 and probably 50 lines of code to solve this problem. I don't grade for conciseness. Like 
having really short code, I don't care. Having really fast code, really performant, again, I don't care. Right? So you can write something for you to read. My main goal is to understand how you're thinking. So the, the best way to do that is have lots of comments. Take up the space you need. Right? So don't feel like you're constrained to try and minimize something. Another cool thing that they did, and this is uh, a feedback that I gave to quite a few people, is they're using one of these little blocks of code. Could be a comment, it could be just blank. These are uh, cell blocks, and they're using it to basically lay out the logical flow of the program. So it's a little bit confusing initially, because like if, if you're coming from a non Jupyter background where you just have like one giant text file and you just that's totally normal, but the way that Jupyter works, it's called literate programming. It's a way of mixing the visualizations and the documentation and the code all in one, one interface. And so the way that you leverage that is you basically think, like, what would a line or a paragraph in an essay be? Right? Where do I make those breaks in, in writing? So it's the same type of thing that you want to do in code, right? This is an idea. The idea here is I'm importing. So that's like a paragraph. Here's another paragraph that has many lines of code in it, right? But it's sort of like is a is a thought, right? A thing that you can encapsulate into a set. Typical good, pra good practice guidelines is like you go in a cell for one screen worth of content. How much do you expect the person reading your code put in their head? That's the upper bound, right? Now, if you have really dumb users, maybe you have smaller cells. Maybe you have really smart users. Definitely speaking, you know. Three lines, maybe 20 at most, if it's not very dense. Um, that's sort of the guidelines for what does a good cell look like. And they're using these cells basically to sort of like chunk out common uh, sections of code, comments between the sections of code. Again, not required, but helpful to the reader to understand. What they're also including citations in line, so that's good. Okay, again, and then at the bottom. Just raw cells down here to say like this is code that I tried, and I wanted you to die. Now I want to just capture the fact that I struggled, but it didn't end up being useful. So yeah, I'm not going to include it in the grading part of this notebook. But for my purposes, I'm just sort of seeing like what did the student try and not use. And you can put those wherever. Like it doesn't. The raw cells don't have to be at the bottom of the notebook. They can be spread out. Like I can read all of your notebook. So you can place, and then I will include that in the grading. Okay, so that was one of them. Let's look at a. I have a couple samples here. All of these are going to end up on the, um, the the Blackboard page for week one under solutions. If you have a problem with that, if you see one of yours up here, you're just like, no one should ever. That's terrible, right? That's fine. Just let me know that you don't want to post it on Blackboard. But I'm, I'm taking charge of your notebooks and posting it without your name, obviously. Okay. Here's another most. They're using the cells to break up. And then they're including the assignment description as a, uh, a, a code cell. So if, I think if you look at this, this is a code. So not exactly what I was uh, specifying for their assignment requirements. I don't think I docked any points off for that. But I do like having the assignment description at the top of the notebook. The reason for that is because then I know that you know what the assignment is. Because typically, someone will write a, a notebook, and they'll complete half the assignment. And is it because they literally didn't know how to solve the second half of the assignment? Or because they didn't capture that second paragraph in the assignment description. So by me seeing that you pasted the entire assignment description in the top of the notebook, I know that you know what the assignment is, or at least copy pasted it. So it doesn't solve the entire problem, but at least it sort of documents the fact that there is a requirement. Okay. And it don't, so this one, there was a lot of um, a lot of code in one giant cell. I'm not a big fan of that. It, it's, I can still read it, right? I can read your Python. It just it, as sort of like easy to break up, and you can sort of see they've already included comments like for a second they're, they're already sectioning off the code, so that's good. So they're partitioning the thoughts blocks of what their code does. But even better, you could use the Jupyter Notebook interface to sort of like section out. This is a cell of code. I'm going to put a comment here as markdown. I can make it look pretty. So there's lots of value to that. The big difference. Is that I saw any visualizations, but eventually when we get to like having visualizations interspersed with code, that's where Jupyter notebooks are really gonna come through in their power. Because if you're used to working in a Python interface where you just have one giant wall of text, 
and then you have to go generate the, the visualization. It's never clear, like, was the visualization from here in the code or down here in the code, right? So the cells is not just the thinking part of it, but the visualization output. Okay, so I'll just look at one more. So this one is let's say, uh, right on target. Or like they've got a markdown cell. They've got their uh, assignment description. And then they in cells, and they're just wandering through and getting the output. Like that's that's a good result. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so <laughs> so the fact that like I really underspecified what the homework was. Nobody. Really, come on. Because <laughs> I always I'm in, I'm aiming to underspecify what the requirements are for the homework. So you should definitely feel like complaining. Yes. <laughs> Things you can decorate to code maybe even more robust there. And I'll have yeah, that in a number of different jobs that isn't this. And just specify the homework. Does anyone have a guess as to why I might use it? Like, other than I'm just a jerk, which is if you take it. You may have a guess for that? Not my intent, but actually tangentially beneficial, yes. Like, your ability to be creative in the code is definitely a good thing. Asking questions, another tangential benefit, which is why do you, why do you, why do you think I underspecify the homework potential? <laughs> yes, yeah, so creativity, ability to sort of demonstrate what you want and ask questions. Another one. Underspecified. Absolutely. That, that is my goal. Right? When, when you leave school, you will hopefully not be conditioned to think that here's an assignment, it's well specified, if I know what the answer is, I do it, I'm done. Right? That is what coursework in a university is. And it drives me nuts. Right? So like because when you leave here, it's never like that. No one will ever say, do this and I will get you an A, do this and I'll get you a B. Right? That is unfortunately how <laughs> the real life is. So I'm trying to prepare you for that. It's a little early in your career for it maybe, but hopefully you get sort of like <laughs> worn down by the fact that, oh, I have to actually interact with my customer. Okay. All right, if, if you find that amusing, I appreciate that. All right, let's go back to the lecture. Any other comments? I spent a lot of time on this first one. I typically won't spend as much time on uh, notebooks, but this was like a lot of background and context. Now that you've been exposed to my style, it will only get worse. All right. So Python 3, um, a lot of exposure either through uh, Data 690, I think, is the, the preview course. Um, so if you've taken that, this might be a little repetitive. And if you have, I'm, I'm assuming in this course you have no Python experience. So if that's the case, and if you've seen this all before, there are a few uh, challenge exercises for you. Maybe not. All right. All right. So, so hopefully, half the class is one of the one reading assignment, and half the other, half the other class is one of the other assignment. And I'm going to leverage the fact that you all almost always return to the same seat that you started out in for the first class. Every class, you have to take a different seat. But by default, you'll just you know, go to the default seat. So I don't know why that is, but I'm going to use that and say, if you're on this side of the classroom, and, uh, which one did I ask? All right. And you guys did it. All right. So you're a little imbalanced. So maybe two of you left, my own person over here. On the opposite side of the room, or did you? And you have to physically, this is my favorite part of the second class, you have to physically. Yeah. <laughs> and you're going to go find someone who did the. Again, there might be some overloading, two people over here with one person over there, but find that person and talk to them about what the essay was about. What did you learn from the essay? All right, introduce yourself. You have any use. And you can even like talk to the person. I'll give you a few minutes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
So there's a lot coming in the semester, and then I'm going to talk about. Uh, so these are the, the lectures, and the, we've already done some homeworks. The other like the class. Yeah. All right. So projects we have three projects, and you have three projects actually. Projects. Um. So there's a few phases to this. There's a proposal, and then there's a Jupyter notebook that you get to write, and then there's a class presentation. So. I think we have almost like 28 people or something. So we're not gonna have time for every single person to present. But in typical Ben fashion, I want you to work on the presentation. So how do I get that to happen? I play a lottery, right? So some of you will be selected to present, but I will not tell you which ones are gonna be presenting. So that means you have to do the work ahead of time to figure out, here's my notebook, here's the data I'm gonna analyze, I'm gonna prepare for the presentation because I don't know what I'll be picking. You could play the, the like, Danger game of like not preparing for your presentation. That's cool. I don't discourage you like that. All right. <laughs> Hold your pants. There's more. <laughs> um, so I just want to expect you in this class to like go hunt for data. That is an arduous task. I personally have many years of finding data. Surprisingly, it's just on one problem. Right. So uh, I work on many problems at work, but one of them took more than three years to find an appropriate data source. So I'm not going to put that burden on you. I, I can give you a list of data sources. So um, the thing that I'm looking for from you is I want you to pick one of those data sources that you have some exposure to, right? So this is in data science, there's the math part, the programming part, and the domain expertise. So I'm going to rely on you to self-select to figure out I'm good at X. Does Ben have a data source on X? And if the answer is yes, that's probably a good thing. Don't pick um, some arcane topic that you have no experience in and then hope to do data science on because you literally won't even know what questions to ask the data. So I advise And if you look through them and you say, Ben, I'm really interested in hockey and you have no data sources in hockey, you know what I'll do? I'll go get your data source. 
I'm pretty effective at finding data. So in the end, you're going to do some very straightforward stuff with this first project. It shouldn't be that much more harmful than uh, one like normal week-long assignment. So don't think of it as like a mechanic, you know, dissertation on data science. It's, it's just like a homework, right? So it's a bit for the presentation. Okay. So um, I don't know where you're coming from necessarily as far as your programming skill or your interest. And so you're going to have to try and set that that it encourages your own growth, and I'll try and like work with you on that. And the way that I do that is the mechanism through the proposal. So you're basically going to say, Ben, I'm interested in X. I'm going to work with data set this, and I hope to accomplish this with the data set. So that's really the, the goal. And, and you're like, Ben, that is underspecified. I'll like, see earlier conversation. So this first one is pretty straightforward. I just want you to sort of like analyze the data. That's really the goal. And you're like, Ben, it's super early in the semester. Yes, it is. We have almost learned no skills, which means this assignment will be pretty lightweight. Right? Like you can do some visualizations, some characterization of the data, and that's about it. So it's sort of like getting comfortable with doing analysis, presenting results. The reason being, this is probably what you'll be doing in the real world, right? Someone will say, here's a data set for our business that we Hey, tell me about it. And your answer is to have a story about that data pattern of the data, these are the anomalies you might be worried about that I drew from the data, right, just by spending a little bit of time looking at it. There's nothing like profound or anything, it's just like, what is in this pile of bits? I have ones and zeros, tell me about them. Okay. How do we have, I'll take some questions, I don't have any like, panicky responses to project one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think so. I don't have the exact due dates in my head, but um, basically you'll submit it. So I'll post the assignment description um, under the assignments, and then there'll basically be a proposal that you have to submit in Blackboard, and then I will uh, review the proposal, grade it as far as meeting the requirements of the proposal, and then either say yes, you should proceed with the assignment or with the project, or no, you know, take some revisions and submit another proposal. So there's a proposal deadline, and then after that there's a a Jupyter Notebook submission deadline in the presentation. Well, so the, like the, the proposal, you won't necessarily know what to visualize yet in your project. And so you'll, you'll basically not be able to do the analysis and make a proposal. You'll have to make a proposal sort of on, uh, here's some data, just thinking of and how it works out. So, now let's, I'm gonna go back. So actually, the the list of data sources is in that link. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blue underlined text is links. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Comment. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. I know. So I have a rubric for the proposal that tells up exactly what I'm looking for in the proposal. Basically, that the data access is free. So one of my big like life objectives is to have reproducibility, and so if no one else can access the data, or say you have to pay a thousand dollars to access the data, those sort of inhibit other people from being able to reproduce your analysis. So basically, free data. It should also be legal. I don't want you breaking laws on behalf of 601 and getting me in trouble. And so those are the sort of like things I'm looking for. Is it big enough? Does it have the right type of data? Right? Like if you say, Ben, I found this data set of 10,000 pictures. I'll be like, hmm, probably good. Right. So data 601 is typically about tables of text data. That's what we're we'll interested in. People have submitted like JSON and XML. Not too common, but most people just say like, I found this Excel spreadsheet or CSV file. Is this sufficient? Okay, don't. Okay, so one more thing before I move on. There are a couple of prohibit. Um, so if you've ever heard of a site called Kegel, anybody here heard of Kegel? Almost are great. Now you know where not to go. <laughs> You're like, Ben, why would you not go to one of the most popular data science websites on the internet? Because Kegel has not only the data sources, but also the data analysis. 
So it's hard for me to understand, did you do the analysis or did you get it from one of the 10,000 kernels posted to the Kaggle, right? So I have this problem of, I can't spend all my time on the Kaggle website figuring out what code you wrote, so I'm just gonna block. Totally cool if you find a data source that's not on Kaggle. It's, I'm gonna, and, and this is where your proposals will typically trip up. You'll say, Ben, I found this great data source on a website that's not Kaggle. My first response is, I will go to that website, and then I'll go to Kaggle, I can all see the, the data, right? And then I go to Kaggle and say, is the, is the data on Kaggle? And if it is, the proposal gets rejected. So you'll have to do a little bit of due diligence to say, I like hockey data, and it's not on Kaggle. Right? So that's sort of like the, um, and then the other website, I think it's called Data World. Anybody here of Data World? Yeah, it's another website. Basically, it aggregates massive amounts of data. The problem with that website is um, they're just um, typically like posting the data, but they don't tell you where the data came from. And so, um, this column means this, and this column means this, and this column means that. You lose that information when you're not the primary source. So it's totally cool to surf around on Data World and see. We'll have to do some extra legwork to figure out where is the actual primary data source. Typically not. But sometimes, like, you know, it varies by whatever <laughs> the source is. But sometimes you have to sort of, like, deduce what all the columns mean, and that's hard. Okay, one, one more extra question. Learn Python. <laughs> so, as I warned you, we're going to have Start pretty simple on the Python. It will just keep coming up over and over. And if I keep showing you things and you've never seen them before, then I'll feel a little bad, right? So this is me acting as my insurance policy for future self to be able to actually teach data science. So there's a lot of stuff, and if, if this is all new to you, and you're like, Ben, you're speeding through this, and I realize 90% of the rest of the class understands what's going on, but I don't, then you need to raise your hand. Like, this class, this, this week two lecture should go as slow so if that's you, I need you to interrupt me. It takes courage, so I already salute your courage if you raise your hand. That's good. Other disclaimer, I'm all about disclaimers. I can't teach you all of Python. This is one, two and a half hour lecture we have already spent is it 30 minutes. So um, we're down to two hours. We're definitely not going to learn Python. But I sent out this long rambling email at 6.30 today, I think. Um, and it had a bunch of resources where you can pick up Python skills. Um, and I think even in the Blackboard links or course content, I linked to the 690 course material. So if you didn't take 690 and you're like, boy, I'm really feeling that lack of knowledge, you can actually just go to the course materials for 690. So those are available. Uh, so I'm all about free stuff, right? Free books, open source books. Thank you for any course textbooks in this class. All right, that's good. So the value is there's lots of people who are so excited about Python, they wrote it. Imagine people are excited about programming language and get it. And that's how crazy the world is, right? There's so many people who are excited about Python that they give their books away for free to you to read on the internet. So I've already collected all those, and they're posted um, on Blackboard. There's a link to all the open source Python textbooks and data science textbooks. All right. I don't plan on writing a data science textbook. The other level of this paper is I'm not a programmer. I've, I took one class in Java 20 years ago and failed it. So that's that's you know your instructor's background. Heads up. I've, I've done stuff since then. Now more disclaimers. <laughs> so we talked a lot about a bunch of different languages. If you remember, they're sort of like over here, and you're like these are all cool languages. I totally agree with you. And and there's a danger, right? Danger is you're going to go to some, some job, and they're going to say, hey, you know, it's hard, right? You're a data scientist. And you're like, uh, I normally taught us Python. Right. So, so that'll, that'll totally happen. Julia, orange. No one uses orange, but you've heard of it now. That's cool. <laughs> but this is a problem, right? The problem is people will expect you to of. So I'm going to make your life easier. I'm going to say, just focus on Python, right? It's so much easier. So this is right? You talk to people and they're like, do you use Spark with your this? And you're like, no, I, I don't. Ah! And you freak out, which is totally normal. 
So, so you have to communicate that you don't know something that's always embarrassing or like the like the reputational harm, right? Like they thought you were smart, now they're not so clear on that part. So um, these are really important conversations to to have with people. Right. And then if you're talking to someone and they're speaking a language you don't understand, like I do, then that's going to cause some problems. Right. So as I, as I sort of gave away, I'm only going to focus on Python. So your life will be so much easier, right? Just one language. It's Python 3, which has been around since 10 years old. So that's good. <laughs> but there's a catch, right? The catch is within this language of Python, there's literally, well, I won't give you the number. And so the problem is, there's this one language, but then as soon as someone says, like, oh, what if I can do this? And then they bundle that capability and go, well, you're facing a problem. Do I write code from scratch or do I go find this library? Right? And this is a problem you're going to keep revisiting with me. You're going to ask, like, Ben, how would we have possibly known about that library? Well, we'll get to the, the trick there. Again, if you're at this point, when you're bored, by answering this question, how many Python packages are there? And let me know what the answer to that is. So. Or, or talk after class. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to be mixing a bunch of language. I'm not consistent in my own use of these. So um, for a library, that's something I'm packaging. So you know, I will confuse you, but not by intention in that case. Um, so there's lots of different things to learn, and I'll try and just be explicit about what I mean. If, if you're confused, just raise your hand. Right. All right. So for now, we have a package in this slide. Um, there's two things: package manager, and they come in flavors of either Anaconda or Pip. I use Pip. I think everyone here is called Anaconda. Is that right? Do we have any non-Anaconda users? So if you're using Anaconda, that means you have a package manager called Anaconda. What that really means is you're writing a Jupyter notebook, and you're looking for some library, and you say, like, import thing. Right? And the import thing statement doesn't work. Now what? Now you have to go figure out, OK, my package manager is Anaconda. What I really need to say is, like, Anaconda install thing. So that that will go out for you and go to the right repositories and download that package, and then you'll be able to run the import statement. So that's what a package manager does. It goes out and buys libraries. That doesn't solve the problem, which is, how do I know which packages exist? Um, so the quick answer to that is, you have to do a little bit of thinking. You have to say, I'm solving a problem. Has anyone else in the world ever solved a problem before? And if the answer is yes, it's highly likely that someone is in the library to do this. And then you get to choose, should I re-implement the code from scratch that takes time, or should I spend time searching for someone else's code which may or may not exist, and may or may not actually do the thing I care about. Right. So when I give you an assignment, it's usually unlikely that someone has written a library to do the assignment. But there's a trick. You can decompose the assignment into smaller chunks. It's like, I want to be able to do this thing. And this thing. Thing. But that first step, oh, I can write that code. It's pretty straightforward. The second step, probably someone said, I should go look for a library. Right. So that's the sort of mentality that I will keep reminding you of because you're going to keep asking Ben, where did we find the package? I'm like, you have to think about it. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You have to sort of know the language of what it is you're searching for in order to put a search term in Google. So I'll be exposing you to probably about 100 packages over the course of the semester. Um, obviously, I can't explain all of them, but there's always documentation for packages. Right. So I'm spending a lot of time on this pretty straightforward concept because I'm super lazy. Laziness is the virtue that I will drive home to you all the time. Can you be lazier? If the answer is yes, good. Laziness is a virtue because it saves you time right, and thinking. So, uh, like, spending a little bit forethought to say, did anyone else already do this part? Oh, that's really being lazy, right? Laziness is a good thing. Saves yourself work. And like, if, if, a, if a company hiring a data scientist 
is smart about their hiring, but they're going to look for the laziest person. Because the laziest person doesn't work, which translates to saving the company money. Right. So, so, don't think of laziness as a bad thing, that's fine. Saving yourself work reduces the number of bugs, it reduces the amount of time you spend on done assignments, or in the real world, spending the business's money. And so these are the things that you If you can write a 10,000 line program, that's cool. If you can write a library that imports somebody else's 10,000 lines, that's even better. Now we've sort of given all the context, let's actually use Python. So I'm going to go over the demos. So the heads up, the foreshadowing is you're going to implement Python on your, on your uh, computer. So if you don't have a computer, you'll probably have to find someone who has a computer and you can pair up with them. But this is all sort of advance notice of what's coming. So I've warned you about Python and I've warned you about Jupyter, but um, it's a little confusing because those aren't actually always relevant. So sometimes you, you won't have access to Jupyter for some reason, and you'll have to use Python in the command prompt. Does anyone here use a command prompt before? Okay, maybe like 25, 30% of the class. So that's cool. Um, most of this class will be focused on Jupyter notebooks. But in this section of the lecture, I'm going to deviate a little bit to show you that it's not actually a requirement that you have Jupyter. Jupyter is nice. It allows commenting and visualization and code, but it's not a requirement. Okay, so we'll start up in, the, in the, what's called the REPL. So this is the read, evaluate, print loop. So it's basically a four-step process. It just is an infinite loop of going over and over and saying, what do you want me to do? And then you type it in, and then it does it. And it says, what do you want me to do? And then it does it. And it asks, what do you want me to do? It's just asking over and over, what is it you want me to do? And you specify a command, and then it goes, does it. So if you can get in that mentality, now, you've, now you understand the command line prompt. The trick is you have to sort of understand what are all the commands I could possibly type into the command line prompt. Well, for that, you have to sort of know Python. There's a cicader of the script. The way that I think of a script is you take all the commands that you typed into the, the command line, the REPL, and you put those in a text file. Okay, so now what happens? Well, now when you run Python against that, execute, 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 execute sequentially. So it, I think of a script as a sequence of commands that I could have typed in, but if I maybe I'm doing it more than once, I'm just going to write all of them into a file and then tell Python, hey, instead of me typing these in over and over, just execute them in the script. Right? So you just execute these sequentially, and all the commands will be executed by Python, and that's typically how people do So this is great for live development. The script is for sharing code. It's better because it has all these extra features. Who's confused about it? Everybody's hat? Yeah, we got one. Yes, question? Um, it's like, uh, do we use the command line? Yeah. Do we use the command line today? We'll take that experience from you. Mm -hmm. I, don't, <laughs> I don't have a definition. So the question was, is Jupyter an IDE, an integrated development environment? I don't know the definition of an IDE, so I'm not going to commit to an answer on that. But I will put it in my backlog. Yes. Okay, so his question is, what is an IDE? If you haven't used an IDE, don't feel bad. They're all over the place. Um, PyCharm, which you mentioned, is one of them. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. yep. So, so another. So, PyCharm is one. Idle is another. So, I'm not sure whether they qualify. Whether Jupyter qualifies as an IDE, though. So, yeah. We'll come back to it later. All right. All right. So, I'm going to show you what the Python REPL, what the command line looks like on my computer. Let me pull it up. Actually, I'm going to cheat. So I'll go with a new. So I'm in uh, Jupyter 
lab, and I'm going to open up a terminal, and it's going to basically give me a command line interface. I'm lucky. Right. So now I'm in uh, a command line interface for the computer. Let's make it a little bigger. Right. And I'm going to type uh, Python 3. So you'll see there's uh, a lot of things coming in. So basically, find the user on and then there's a picture name listed by one number. And then I totally agree. Linux, this is totally confusing. So I found that it's a dollar and they were living on a name. So I said, each one is going to be a dollar and a dollar. And then it enters into the terminal. Uh, the demanding the 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 a different command prompt, like a thing with like legal errors. This is different. So if you've never seen those, it means you're in a Python command prompt. Up here's the prompt of the dollar sign. Now we can do a Linux prompt. So there we go. Help. Right. So all that is a bunch of text. Um, and so we're going to go off and do some crazy things. Let's, whoop, I don't want to get out of that. Let's return to the interpreter. Quick. Okay. Clear? No. All right. So I'm going to type in a list. Okay. So there's a lot going on already. of the elements is totally cool. Other this is like uh, giving you a little more time to do this list. Okay, I typed enter and nothing happened. This is the duty of computers. You do something and then nothing responds. Um, okay, so I'm gonna type the word my, which is that variable that I answered before. And then I Another miracle. If you've ever built a computer from scratch, it's a miracle. Okay. Now we're going to make it complicated. All right. So I, 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 I said this in the first element. Well, that's true. It's the zero element also. So that's a list element. Python start from an index. Never like been in computer science. I apologize and welcome to computer science. We start counting from zero rather than one. So even though I told you this is the first element of the list, 
it is actually the zero element. And I call, hey, list, tell me about this index zero. Right, yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right, I can do a screwy thing, so. Error message, right? Because there is an index 12 in my list. All right. I'm going to type this really weird command. Let me know what it does. Great. Right. 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 No. Who did not raise their hand? That's my real question. No, you're not willing to. Okay. Well, it does this. Blank, right? So another like scary programmer thing. They never use the whole. They want to define a function. They use the word def. If they want to get the length of a list, they use length, right? So laziness is a recurring theme. Not because I like it, but because it's programming and computers. Okay. Now here's another, I mean, tell me how this goes, right? So. So raise your hand if you don't know what this is going to do. A couple people will not be able to explain what this is going to do. What are they going to do? Okay. We got a guess. So my guess was that we're going to have a list of lists. So let's look at that. Dang it, nothing happened. I mean, like, this is a, again, sorry, apologies. My. All right, so with all the variable mine and returning, what? And it's got this list at the zero element. That's like, mine below number one, right? And I overwrote all the other. So back up here, if we scroll up a little bit, I used to have. <laughs> it's like literally minutes ago. But now I overwrote those with a it overwrote the thing and it didn't warn me. There's good things about programming and this bad thing about programming. So like you overwrote the element of a list, Python's like, cool, you told me to. So it just heads up. Alright. That's right. With a list. Because they replaced a number with a list. All right. All right. Let's see what else I'll do. All right. I think I want to show this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue blowing your mind. So let's look at dictionaries. Maybe I'll just yeah. Okay. So that's all the things. Um, you should be able to. Sort of like I with the simple commands. I skipped over those, but you can come back to those. All right. Five. All right. Does anybody know what this is called? Show it up. Dictionary. All right. So we got some people. I even warned you to call my dictionary. Okay. Other logic. I'm really not afraid of that variable name. Like my. It would have been better to call my list, but I didn't even do that. Okay. So my. So the dictionary, thing. basically the construct is you've got a key and a value, and you have a list of key values. So in this case, I just need an early and a key value. So that's like the fundamental idea behind a, a dictionary. Again, it didn't warn you what it did. And now it can edit it, and we'll say like, I want actually the numbers for. Okay, so let's just see what that verb looks like now. So the the tricky part about a dictionary is that you can't have keys. So that, that's like remember I foreshadowed a little bit like lists. You can have duplicates in the list. Dictionaries you can have duplicates in the values. So let's do that. That's totally cool. What's not cool is if I do this. Just make it extra clear that this is not a problem. Oh, what happened there? Did I do something wrong? Oh, you know what? I probably overwrote it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is the same key for different 
value in. And then when we find out it is just more the world that I will give you the same media You should be frightened, right? Because what hap what is the consequence of these like silent changes? It's when you're writing a program, you're gonna run into some bugs and you're like, I didn't do everything right. And then you have to go back through your program and find out what is the value of this variable? What's the value of this variable? And you'll see that's not what I intended. Python never warned Python never warning you. Okay. Let's do some other dumb things and just hopefully that prevents people from doing it in real life. Right. All right, so let's do this. Uh, two, and then we'll do it like a four, and all right. So, raise your hand if you think you know what's going to happen to this one. Got one, two. Okay, so this is, this is now a cool thing, right? So this is where but most people are not going to claim that they understand what's going to happen here. All right. Came back to this really weird word, right? So on an app. Okay. If you've never seen that word, don't do that. It's not really a word, right? But it's like saying it's an action that I tried to do, but we can't do it on that app. So that doesn't solve the problem of what is a hash, right? So like, <laughs> so basically, a hash is I want to take the thing that. I make it a unique representation. I mean, it transforms into some identifier that is unique to all things. And so, this is a number of the frame, and it is a unique representation. This key is a list that is causing the problem. And the reason for that is because a list is not actionable. All that really means is that there's not a unique representation of the element of the list and the of the list. So the fact that you can reorder the list means it's not hashable, means there's not a unique representation of it, means you can't use it as a key. Some dictionaries, but they're probably one of the most useful things in Python as far as data structures. We just did. This is it. Well, so there's an exercise coming up in like 30 seconds, so. All right, one more thing to like, you know, Make drive you nuts. So we're gonna do this. Okay. All right. Let's let's fix our problem. So now we're gonna do like four and two. But now I'm gonna introduce a new problem, right? So this is like Ben's crazy time. I hear a question, but I can't. Okay. Just raise your hand if you have one. All right. And right. can, can you raise your hand if you can see what is going on here? And it's just not a vision of what you actually like, understand what's going on. Okay. One answer. All right. A few answers in the back. All right. So what's going on here? We've got a dictionary variable. We've got a find rate. And we've got a key and a value. The value of is a dictionary. You can nest lists. You can nest dictionaries. Wait, wait, wait. You can list. You can put a list as a value in a dictionary. Things go crazy, right? This now means like you're you're unleashed on the programming world. All right, so let's type in my dick. So, dictionary as a value, as part of a key, all the normal constraints apply to the key has to be unique. And so, crazy down. All right, now it's time for an exercise because I've taught you everything I know about lists. All right, so, um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, you're keeping it. Um, I don't don't turn the paper. In. So in order to remove the elements of creativity I normally ask for, I'm going to ask you what did you eat today. That should be pretty straightforward. If you can't remember, make something up and be creative. And this isn't a requirement for grading. So. 
So read the slides. Like, what did you eat today? Or sorry, when did you eat? And what did you eat today? So those are the key and values. So write those on paper. If you were before, you didn't do homework assignment one right, but um. All right, so I'm always, the way I think is, I want you to write the program on this paper. If you can't do that, it means you haven't internalized the data structures and the commands of the programming language. So, on paper, then you can go to the command line interface and say, let's see if that program works. Okay, and once you've got the paper, so the assignment written down on your paper, and then you put it in your computer, we'll be on the other three until I'm available for questions. If you're lost and you can't get this to work, let me know. Questions? Can I just use this or? Um, so this is the Jupyter Yeah, so that's uh, Say, I guess. I want to go back over to the. Hey, this one. Uh, no, I'm still playing again. Eventually. All right. Well, once they respond, well, actually, do these other are these other ones working or not? No. Um, Eventually, it will come up and let me grab me, and I'll come back. Okay. All right. Other. So you should be able to command my
That and put it into a in a web page. Uh, just 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 the hatch, just the link there. Uh, yeah. You'll have to you'll have to put it in a web browser. So it's a web link. Okay. I'll say don't use it in the next whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now we're gonna go in new and no terminal. So, right. So I'm going to cheat and not type all this stuff. But basically, here's an example. If you're, oh, if you're still missing. So this is an example of what you could type in. Basically, the trick here is the dictionary has some strings, like breakfast as a string. That's my key. And then for breakfast, I didn't need very much. I just an apple. So that's another string. Now for lunch, I was more adventurous. I had a uh, two-course meal of beans and salmon. Right, so I have list, and each element in that list is a string. So this is exploiting all the knowledge that we just went over. Um, and then, let's see, I made a mistake in that first time, which is my list. So list always has a square bracket. And so that's where that problem is. And so here's the thing. OK, so now one thing I didn't tell you about is the fact that you can take a dictionary value and go through the key. So that's what's going on here. I have the key lunch and then points to a list. And so when I ask for the variable my meals with the key lunch, what is the value? Okay. Alright. So there's, there's been some words, like we've got dictionaries, we've got keys, we've got values, we've got lists, we've got elements of lists. Um, so there's all these words. And so it's somewhat unreasonable for me to expect you to know all these words. And I don't really have time to teach you, so we're going to have an exercise that covers all these words. So that's the trick. All right, so we will go over these words um, in an exercise. I'm going to do a few more. I'm going to know what's going on here. 
to you. Yeah. So we'll cover functions, and I think the exercise comes up pretty soon. Let's see. So let's go over to this one. There you go. All right. So as I warned you, the word def means definition. I have to define a function. It says I'm going to do it my func. Right. So the way that functions work, you have a this is a function coming out, and then you have the thing that is the name of the function. This is function. And then I have a input argument or not. Right. It's always enclosed in commas. Question. Parentheses. The parentheses are taking an input. So this is going to be your homework is to write a function. So I'm going to take in a variable, a cool variable, right? And then the end of a function declaration, you're actually like a, a colon on this line. And then the so first line, we've got uh, four different things going on. And then I might have return. This is another Python method. So this is almost, this is in very few languages, but Python lies on indentation. So if you if you're coming from uh, so Java to the world where you're like C or Greek you know, back all braces that you like use you use that to manage what is the body of my function, you're ever gonna use braces. So the what's called the Python uh, it's PEP standard, but there's like four spaces. So I'm always gonna indent my functions by four spaces. Common mistake that I see a lot of students make is they're going for the laziness, which I appreciate. They don't want to do all this spacing. The problem is different computers interpret tabs differently. Four spaces, sometimes the tab is eight spaces, or the tab can be user defined number spaces. And this causes problems. So to avoid any of those problems, always use four spaces. Right? So it, it, if you'd use tabs after this, this was the demarcation. You could have used tabs. after this, you're all using spaces. So your program. So here's the tricky part. You'll write a program. You'll use tabs. It'll work. And you'll say, "I'm done." And then you hand it off to someone else who is not using your computer. Find the same way, and it won't work. Yeah. Yeah. This is a not that I'm aware of. Yeah. So, so it automatically, I think what you're saying is it automatically indents the appropriate number of spaces. That is a true statement. Yes. It doesn't, so it knows, like if you're putting it, so here in the terminal, when I type enter, it was not smart. It did not know that. But in Jupyter, yes, it's automatically filling in those four spaces. Jupyter, right? Jupyter is portable, and that feature is in Jupyter. That's portable. That depends on your computer. Yeah. Whether a tab is interpreted as four spaces and like automatically translated, that's the computer. Is it possible that it's translated in four spaces and then you can do it in five days and then they're going to have to do it? I think you can do it somewhere around like that word. Yeah. But yeah. Question. Yes, absolutely. So if you define a function and then hit return, then you very well usually put the core spaces in for you. It so it won't act put in the tab. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you should just worry about, you know, did, did you very correctly put in the spaces? And they're not a thing you worry about. If you, that's because you do it coming up. Yeah, it will never, like, fill in tabs for you. Like, whenever in it because they put the tabs there manually. Why they do that, I don't know. But, okay. In the command box, the name is like this. Okay, the last thing that I care about in a function is the return statement. So, I gotta spell it right. So there's inputs. So I didn't have anything happening in this function, so it's sort of boring. 
I could return nothing, or I could just return the virtual variable, right? So this was a really dumb function. It literally takes one input and returns one output. That's not typically what we're using functions for. Like some section of code, but you'll remember that we also did that with cells, and so then you're like, why would I use a cell if I have functions? And the reason is because typically you're going to be using a cell when you just pass through this like, section of code once. That's a good use of a cell. It's like it partitions out your section of code. A function is typically I'm going to have a section of code typically the same size roughly as a cell, but I may be using it many times. That's like differentiation number one. The other, other major differentiation is that you can pass variables into and out of functions. And so I could pass in, like, add the number 2 to whatever you put in. Right? That's not something that you can do a cell. So even though cells and functions are both for encapsulating code, a, a function is much more capable in terms of, like, you can call it many times and you can pass in different variables. So that's the difference. <laughs> Question. No? Okay. All right. So this is now my question for you of please make a prediction. So I'm going to pass the variable 5 into the, uh, the, the value 5 into the variable a. I'm going to define a function of uh, input. And then I'm going to say a equals 6. All right. Use two spaces here. A equals 6. 6. And then I'm going to print a. I take one key and then return enter, what is it going to return? So raise your hand, let's have an answer. Two, four, five, six, seven. Most people are claiming they know the answer. So I'm going to ask you for your prediction. Just like, wait. Hold that prediction in your head. I'm going to press the enter key. All right, ready? I'm going to count down three, two. What is going on there, right? Okay, now this is confusing. Straight up, right? So we get the variable, and now we wrote this function, we said a equals 6. So now in your mind, maybe a is 6. And then we went so far as to say, like, you know, not just define this function, but actually use it. Right? So this is clearly a equals 6. And then when you're being you're this, like, you're trying to a equals 5, you're just like, where did that come from, right? This is a comparable scope. And it will kill you, right? So, like, there, watch out. So the problem is, we define this variable a in like the main program. And then we said, here's your little. Don't actually get it, like, hold this off to the side. And then we said, okay, actually go use it, right? Just like call that way. And it turns out that even though there was a little a, we had that little stupid code, it's not part of our main model. And so we actually never discarded that our original name. And this is confusing. We've never seen this before. So let's go. You be aware of it. It's the thing that, like, a little bit of code, right? And it's separate from the number. Absolutely correct. Correct. Silent but deadly, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Terrible. All right. I think that's all the games I have for today. Let's see if I can go back. All right. So that's sort of just a you. If you get confused, you can definitely use that. All right. So um, there's the, the terminal interface, which some of you have already used. There's the um, Jupyter web interface, which we'll be using for most of the class. And the last one that's done is sort of like an in-between state called a script. The letter is E-Y. So it's just a convention. It's not a law. It's not a requirement. It's just a thing that we do. So it makes your ability to communicate with other people about what the intent of that script is very quick. So PY. All right. So this is where it gets a little complicated. The way in which you edit the PY file is not with Jupyter typically, and it's not in the terminal, it's with something else. And so on Windows, there's no head. On the Mac, there's flex edit. On the assignment, the whole project here is not writing the code, it's getting the code to run. Right? So you have to like use a text editor. And use Word, and use PowerPoint, and you have to be able to see file extensions that you want.
there's lots of options. I'm not sort of like bragging that these are the best. I'm just saying they exist on your computer because you have an operating system. Okay. Now we're going to work with uh, another partner because this is a complicated program. So I'm going to go off and assign you partners because I don't trust your ability to find someone other than your desk mate. Let's see. All right. It's this one. This one. Okay. So I happen to have just the reason we started a little late is because I was like making this list of students. So let's go and I've got this list, which you're now familiar with list structures, right? Everybody's happy? Okay. And <laughs> this one has tabs in it, just amusingly, right? <laughs> I apologize. I'm going to import the random library. I'm going to say, so sometimes I need an individual student. I can just not do that. That's relevant right now. But then I've got this little function called pop random. I go through. I should probably cite that. All right, let's. Yeah, so there's my list of pairs. If your name appears in this list, please ignore the slash T that's a cat character. Um, find out the person. And the probability is you don't know them. That's a good thing. So find your partner. One of you should have a computer. If either of you have a computer, find your partner, and one of you should have a computer. Right, those name tags come into super handy around, right? <laughs> So is anyone here like not partnered because they were with me? <laughs> okay, so now you've found your or unhappy. Sorry? Okay, so of the two of you, one of you qualified to do this work, so you're going to get to do the work. Who is less qualified among the pair, right? So that's the thing that you're going to have to talk over and figure out. And then you've got the challenge, right? The challenge is write a .py file. The only one of you needs a computer. The less experienced person is in charge of that computer. And if both of you are confused and you're not making progress, let me know. There's a limited amount of time for this activity. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now the challenge is that file exists on your computer. So we need to figure out where on your computer that file exists. So do we have the ability to open a command prompt? Terminal? Yeah, let's open up a terminal. Yep, it's like uh, there you go. So you have to so type DIR. Yep, enter. So DIR asks what are the what are the files in the current directory? So there's my assign.py. Right? So now we can type Python space assign.py. That's terrible. I'm gonna make a prediction that it will work. So so I thought it was gonna break on the fact that this is capital A and my four case is put the wrong. The problem is you have a capital P in front. Now let's go back to the assigned up UI and edit that. Thank you. 
download us. That's going on. Yeah, don't think I have any solutions there. <laughs> you don't have it yet. Okay. So I think a lot of people were working on palindromes. If you're worried about like what is the answer to the palindrome, there's so many solutions. So like that's definitely on Google, and you can go look it up. But yeah. if you really want to know like what are all the different ways I can do it, um, we can talk after class. So let's come back to our seats and and restart. By the way, if you really enjoyed working with your partner and you want to solve the palindrome problems, that's totally a thing that you can do. You know, and it won't be sort of like the thing that's sorry. Totally challenge to go and talk to your partner about palindromes. It's not an assignment. Okay, so you're all back in your seats. Uh, we've got a few minutes before break. So there's, just to reiterate, these are the things that often trip people up when they're starting on Python. So like the lack of sort of spaces um, as tabs, right? And like only using three spaces versus four, four spaces. Python is really sensitive to using a consistent number of spaces, and the standard is used for. The other thing that really confuses people, like I never said that it was a list or a dictionary or a string or a number. It just happened. That's a good thing because if it makes you lazy, like you can just type in numbers that Python recognizes. This can be dangerous. Um, and so in the homework, I'll have a little challenge if you're bored by the homework. So um, uh, checking is a thing that's possible. Right? Ben's question. No? Okay. If you, so here's, a, here's, a, here's a, a Ben trick, right? If you really love your partner and love talking to them, GCAT or whatever other chat program or texting is totally cool. The verbal interrupts, those are the ones. So if you're typing away to your partner who's sitting next to you, that's a good thing in this class. Okay. All right. So verbal interrupts are the thing to wait for. Then I'm not going to talk about it, but here's a bunch of tricks. If you're like, Ben, how do I know that my code is properly formatted? Do I talk to you? Yes, you could. Or you could use the program that okay, your program is properly formatted. So they're called linters. So Python lint will check, is this program using four spaces at every indentation? If they're not, they'll warn you and they say, hey, this program may run, but this is the way to get it right. So the relevance there is if you're working on a gigantic team of like 10 developers and there's that one who always messes up their code, you can use a, a linter to make sure that everybody's programming towards the same design. That becomes all the code, but the design of the code. Consistency of the design can impact how you think about the code. It's easier to think about code if it's all consistently formatted. And the Python community has arrived at standards by which the code should look like. That makes it easier to read across different implementations. I get to read all of your code, which didn't go through a linter. That's the fun part. You could run a linter, and then I'd be shocked. <laughs> all right. So um, <laughs> we're going to take a little. Uh, uh, let's see. I think we'll take a break because we didn't really have much of a first one. So we'll take a, a second break, and then it's activity. Which is a lot of fun. Right. So let's take, take a break and come back at eight forty-seven. So I'll be up front. I can come talk to you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's about the homework. Okay. I have I have a little complaint. Yeah. Because I got ten points. Yeah. Uh, you see, I didn't put the. Assignment description. Yeah. Yeah. But I took assignment programming. I gave you the task. I, I was supposed to bring all the homework assignments. Yeah. But it was not inside the rubric. But I didn't understand it that way. I just put because I'm like, if you give me the homework, means you know, programming the composition of the grid. I think it's the only one with that title. <laughs> The, the specific requirements of the are in the assignments. 
I thought, I thought it was too long just to print all. I imagine if I have three pages of homework, do I have to print it there? Because of all the other people, they just like copy all the homework and paste it there. <laughs> that day I didn't understand it like that. I just think that if I refer what what I'm doing, like I say week one assignment call coming, that will be enough because it's always the same thing. Okay, I'm, I think I'm willing. So because so a lot of students didn't put anything in there, so the fact that you've included the title and you had the intent there, I think I'm willing to reward you five points for like having the intention. So <laughs> I will update you to 95. Does that work? Okay. okay. I was really like, I think eventually <laughs> I'm coming back to my okay. uh, the. You wanted to show me a local. No, I don't know if I try to click it. Is nothing is happening. I write Python. I write Python. Yeah. After that, it just Python three. Oh, nice one. I'm not Python three. So I write. I wrote Python three. It was not. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much.
So we need some new partners. Let's rerun the script. Nice partners. So for this exercise, you're not going to get rid of your experience. You'll have lots of space on a desk. And that means you're going to get rid of the use up there. And that's what we'll do. So you need a lot of space. You're going to need like this much. No computer, so don't need a computer. Sorry, I was going to <laughs> No, we're not on calendar. All right, find your partner. Oh, we have another partner. Are you solving the palindromes at all times? Yeah. Fine. All right, so. All right. Find your partner, you love the space. You guys deserve it. You love your. some gifts now let's see what's in them all right so you have this set of papers there's really two sets of papers right so if I unbundle them there's two of them one of them is a set of words and the other is a set of definitions they should be randomly ordered so that means you're gonna have to pair them up go this is challenging and you need lots of space so if you don't have space make space or find phrases. I'll be back momentarily. Oh 
there's, by the way, lots of different strategies. If you think you're doing the sort of like dumb thing, try some other strategy, right? Lots of strategies. So who here has discovered the blank entries? Everybody got blank entries? When you're done, raise your hand and I'll give you more info.
That was way harder. Okay, so let's let's finish up. Um, we've got most people coming to the end. 
if you've already completed, take the errors that you've paired up and split them into words and definitions, and stack them back in files. So it's like all the words going one, all the definitions going together. other. Set those back together and take uh, the answers you will be on the blackboard. I think the answer is <laughs> you, can take a, you can take like a, a picture of it. <laughs> no, 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 no ordering. Shuffle is better. Because I have to shuffle these after getting done. Okay, so clip everything back together. You'll have a stack of words and a stack of definitions, and then return them up to the front table here. I'll put them back together. Yes, yes. If you really like this game, all of the answer keys, and you can make up your own own by using the word document afterwards, and you can make your own game. It's a fun game, right? Okay, so you can continue to uh, clean up your game. I'm going to continue on with the lecture. Just wander up front here and place your, your, your game chips back in the bag. All right. I'm going to skip over the quizzes because I think everybody's pretty happy with this. Um, yeah, by the way, you should be back at your desk pretty soon. <laughs> All right, so basically the, the trick here is Lang. L-E-N is length. So I've already showed that. And the length of this list is, anybody got it? You can shout it out this time. Four, right. So there's four elements in the list. That's pretty straightforward. We're going to skip over the voting in Blackboard to make it a little faster. We've got the length of the list. The answer is four. We're happy. Um, I'll wait for people to finish up. So what would the my list Bracket one return. So raise your hand when you think you have an answer. Most people are happy. So the, the one element, this is where people get confused. So element one is D. Right? And, the, and the reason for that is because Python lists count from zero. So the zeroth element is A. The first element is B. Okay. <laughs> So basically, we've covered all of the sort of like fundamental things in Python. You can think of like CSVs, JSON, XML, reading files, and working with data structures. Like this is really the core of data science, right? Like if, if you can master these very core concepts, you can do a lot of stuff, and it's very powerful. After this, everything is sort of like decorating with libraries and doing fancy things with those data structures. So we're going to get a little bit further in this class, but that is like to me the very core. So let's just uh, go back to my interpreter to play this deer game. Here we go. Right. So sometimes I get lost, and like I, I maybe I don't have an interpreter, and I'm like, what is going on? Right? Like, what's what's in my pro what's in my computer's memory right now? I can't see that, right? So I can see what's in my memory of my computer by typing deer. So deer will just show me what are all the things that the computer is thinking about. And then it is retaining for your use. So you can ignore all these underscore stuff, but sort of like the, the overhead of Python. 
the things that you might recall from our, our typing history is A, my, my, dick, my, thumb, my, thumb. It's like all these things are still in memory. Now, this typically isn't useful, but it is a sort of a danger thing. The danger thing is like, I think my A is five, right? Well, okay, does A even exist? Like, this is a big question. So, this tips a lot of students off um, when they're using Jupyter Notebooks because I'll run a cell, a cell will have some variable definitions in it, and then I'll run another cell which will have some more cell de uh, variable definitions in it, and I'll keep running cells. And I've seen notebooks submitted with literally 500 executions of 10 cells. That means they ran to like, when you run a cell in Jupyter, it's a little one there, and when you run another cell, it's a little two there, right? And so if you see a notebook with 10 cells in it, and the execution count at like 500, it means they've executed those cells 50 times. Okay. At that point, you're probably very confused because you have no idea what's in the computer right now, right? Like, you could type deer, and that's like one thing, like seeing what is what is the variable, what is even in the computer at this point? Because I can't remember what I did 50 times ago. The other thing that I really recommend, and this is like the real solution uh, in my case, is like if I go to kernel, restart run all. Restarting the kernel, that means all the things that are in Python, they're going away. It means we're going to start from scratch. And when I run all the cells, it's just going to execute the cells in order. So that's really what you want. That's right. Uh, well, yes. So, so the, the first one, it restarts the kernel, but doesn't um, destroy any of your outputs. So like if you had a visualization there, it'd still be there, but none of the variables would be in memory. The second option of restart kernel is clear all outputs. Wipes everything out of memory and removes all the displayed output. So sometimes you run this in the you know, The biggest sort of like nuclear option is you restart the kernel, which means all of your things in memory go away, and then you run all the cells. The real value there is you can, the, that command runs all the cells in order, and it will show you what happens from top to bottom. What is going to happen when I execute the first cell, the second cell, the third cell, right? So rather than you having to like run the cell, okay, run the cell, run the cell, run the cell. This one command. Wipes everything out of memory, so you're starting from a clean slate, and executes all of your cells in order. That's super handy, because when you send your notebook to me, and you think, what is Ben going to experience? Ben's going to experience the code you've written and the outputs. And if I need to go rerun your notebook, it's going to be running without anything in memory and from top to bottom. If you're really curious, just before you submit the homework, I definitely recommend running your notebook from scratch top to bottom. That'll make very clear what it is that I'm getting. If you haven't run that command, you should definitely run it pretty often. Like, you know, if you're running your notebook like 50 times, that's bad practice because you just don't know what's in memory anymore. So when you want to restart your notebook, run that command in kernel, restart run all. It's a little bit of buttonology, but it's a little bit of like, why is your computer doing what it does? All right. Now we've spent, well, let's recap. We've, we've looked at the terminal. We've typed Python into the terminal with those three carrots, right? And then we wrote some Python scripts. And that's probably the last time you'll ever see that, right? Like, we're not going to spend much time on that the rest of this entire semester. We're going to spend almost all of our time in Jupyter and Pandas. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about Jupyter and Pandas in case you haven't taken 690. So one of the complaints you may be wondering is, like, Ben, you're just playing with, like, fiddly data, like, print hello. That is so small, right? Like, what are we going to do real data science? We'll get there. Um, but just to say, like, how far can you go? Well, you can make production use of notebooks. Like, so Netflix analyzes all of their video and all of their user data in Jupyter Notebooks. Like, that is their company workflow in Jupyter. So it really can scale to many users with really large data sets and complicated problems. Um, and sort of like, you know, how much is complicated? Well, if you had 60 million images, you could still use Jupyter. Like, it's just a front end that does visualization. So you're not computationally bound by Jupyter in some sense, which is pretty nice. Okay. There are some problems with it. So as I mentioned, I always restart the kernel, run all. The reason that's really important is because sometimes you can run the first cell, and then the second cell, and then the third cell, then go back to the second cell, but then the fourth cell, and then the, and the first cell. And at some point, you have no idea, again, what is going on. And, then, and the person who you give your notebook to, they're not going to know that you executed this one, and that one, and this one, and this one. What they're going to do is they're going to run the cells top to bottom. 
And so the fact that you can have two different workflows through your notebook, one where you randomly hop around the different cells, which may get the results you want, but isn't reproducible. That's a problem. So it's like a design flaw of Jupyter, is that you can do it badly. So that flexibility is harmful, because if you're relying on it, it means it's not reproducible. Yeah, if, if, if they're very small cells and they don't take any time, you'll, you won't even see the ordering. It'll just like do all of them. Yeah, well, it, it was so fast you couldn't notice that there was an ordering. Yeah. All right, so there's some actually cool presentations that I actually recommend uh, watching about what are all the problems with Jupiter. The reason that's worth investing your time in is because you're probably going to run into almost all these problems yourself. One way of running into them is like encountering them in the wild for the first time and you've never even thought about it, and that's your introduction to the problem. That's going to be very painful because it's going to waste a lot of your time. Alternatively, you could watch these sort of like overviews of what are the problems with Jupiter, and then when you know how to not use your tool and how to avoid it, you'll save yourself some time. Okay. It's still widely used, even with all the problems. All right, so we've introduced Python, and then we've introduced Jupyter. That's a web interface that runs the, the actor of Python. And then there's this third thing we're going to spend almost all of our time in this class in Pandas. Pandas is a library that runs in Python that is you know, interactive with through Jupyter. So if you're confused, you've got three different things going on, plus your operating system and your computer and all those things. So data science is hard because you have to be like a technologist. You have to know all these different things. We're going to talk about data frames uh, later. And obviously, there's lots of tutorials because Panda is super hot. All right. Like I, I, I hate talking about overviews, but this is almost all overview. So I'm going to actually take a break and do some real work, right? Because that's what I like doing. All right. So let's go bowling. Anybody here bowled before? Awesome. So we have domain expertise, right? <laughs> Seriously, this is all it takes. All right, so I'm going to skip the sketch because we're short on time, but basically we're going to go to this web page. Let's see if I can get there. Yeah, that one. All right, so I went, you know, this is how I work, right? I, I, I look, okay, bowling data, where can I find, okay, Google bowling. All right, so I go to this web page. It's got all this stuff on it, blah, blah, blah. Oh, look at this. We have... And then we have numbers, numbers, and commas, and more numbers. Who wants to guess what those might be? Oh, thanks. All right. Everyone to get a stab at what this might be. So, 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 so someone else here is telling us. Yeah. Name of the so what is this picture again? Uh, let's see. Um, open championships. So so championships, blah, 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 blah. Both cities. Okay. Well, what we're really going on here is we've got a championship of bowling and the number of people who attended that championship. Wild guesses here, but this is sort of we've got three or four columns maybe. Right? So it's it's sort of inconsistent. This one here has a city but no state. That's going to cause us problems, right? And so again, work. I see all these numbers and they're on a giant list. But what I really want is a visualization. I want to see what this looks like, right? Time, years, participation, and number of people. What does it look like? So we can sort of like scroll through here. Okay, we've got some big numbers. Down at the bottom, I don't care. We've got some small numbers, right? So maybe we've got like back in the day, there weren't many people attending this polling championship, and nowadays there's lots of people. So maybe it looks like a line going up, right? That's that's a guess. And the reason that's a useful guess is because it tells me what I should be aiming for. What do I expect the output to be? And if that's not the output for my visualization, I should go back and check why that wasn't the case. Did I screw up my analysis? Was the data really that case, right? So like. 
just here sort of quick skimming the data, I think there's a couple columns. I think there's some numbers. Let's make a plot. Sounds like project one. Okay. All right, if you didn't catch that, I'm, I'm going to go to a donut book and actually do it. All right, again, I'm lazy, so I actually went off and did all this work before class, so you don't have to watch me type. And this notebook will be available, or is available, in the uh, Blackboard. So, all right. So I have uh, an import statement. Right. And then I link. This is where the data is coming from. I'm very explicit about that. Because I want someone else who runs this notebook to be able to go get that data. All right. Now I've got this. Start with the right? that? All right, let's go figure out what Ben did there. This is like new Ben looking at what old Ben did. I mean, it's not too hard. So, all right, so there's a CSV. That's not quite actually a correct representation because it has already edited it. So let's go back over to here. This is the real file. So this should look pretty familiar, right? So we've got all these numbers here. What does Ben really do? Cut and paste. That's right. So this is a web page. You can do this. And then getting the right amount of text. I've copied all that. And all I've really done is just jam this into a file where I got this one. Bowling CSV, I pasted in here. That's it. I have a data set. All right. <laughs> I mean it can be compl more complicated than this, but I'm pretty lazy, so the fun thing is, once you rename it .csv and it's got a bunch of commas in it, Jupyter already recognizes, oh, that looks like a table. I'll just format it as a table, right? So that's pretty sure. OK, now you've got what looks like a CSV. You're pretty happy. So now they work. We're going to use a model. So now we're confused because back in one a week ago, when was the column And there is a column header, right? So here are bowling stats that starts at like twenty eighteen with some numbers. But there's no actual header in here. No, made the first row a header, which is a default behavior, but it's not what we really intended. So there's this magical command called header. Okay, so this is all So this is Editing this cell, I decided to just make a new cell and show you that this is the thing that I need to do. And you're like, how, how did you know that the command was editing this cell? Google is your friend. And there's a the documentation on Python. So like, if you say Python, how do I, or sorry, pandas, how do I, in pandas, read a CSV? Google that and take you to the read CSV command. Okay, now I'm in the read CSV. How do I ignore headers? Google, panda, the pandas, uh, read CSV, ignore headers. Right. So again, it's just iterative, it's painful. The good news is I'm not making you memorize every single command and command line option in Panda as much as Python. So I don't see that as reasonable or scalable. So the other method is just sort of like iterative search for the thing you want to do. The challenge is you have to have some idea of like what is a header? How do I not get the header in the thing that I have? Right. So you're kind of screwed either way, but there's one option. I'm not, if you want to go off and learn all the commands and command line options in, in pandas, good job. Right? But here, now I pull it. Don't think of the first row as a header so it doesn't do that anymore. And yes, I can go validate that that is actually something that looks like what the file is talking about. So, uh, actually, make this point. What does that do? Okay, so it's all the command line for the. Manage from the data. So this is taking whatever policy I command, 
and running it through the terminal and running that thing. So on Mac, there's a command called head. And so the rest of this whole thing is being executed on my computer and then we also need to be computer. So how I all right. In Windows, you get the PowerShell environment. Yes. Yeah. So you get PowerShell. So you get and Python. Yeah. So, if, so an example of this is if you're on Windows, you did exclamation dir, that will run a command dir in PowerShell on Windows. So, your windows, correct, correct, because there is no head command in PowerShell. <laughs> if you remind me, I will point it to you. It's a little complicated. PowerShell is not as easy. <laughs> okay. So, again, so we, we made a guess about what they think about and then the they might easier that they I'm going to go out and label these problems as. What happened there? All right. Remember, all of our CSV has this comma as a delimitator, right? Good news, I have columns. Bad news, I have a column that has a number in it that has commas. This is this is like okay. Review for the rest of the semester. Your life sucks. You have to deal with this problem all the time, right? Okay. So, so there's lots of different ways to solve this problem. I'm gonna take a really long-winded route, but we'll get there. So I'm gonna split these. So, the hand of the computer, the hand of 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 the Parameter switch here when we're reading with the So lots of different ways to, to get the same result. All right. So remember that the first one was like 7,556. Down at the bottom of the list, there weren't a thousand people participating. So what happened? So we look at the bottom of the so the year, the city, 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 the 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 7,556 got split into columns, and then at the bottom of the data frame, where you only had like 41 people, there wasn't a thousandth place. And so everything in the hundreds place got shifted over to the second the column one column because there wasn't a thousandth and it didn't have a comma proceeding. So I mean, I'm not taking you through because I really care about polling. I'm taking you through because this is a relatively simple example of the real problems you'll see in real data. This is gonna have this is gonna be a bit problem. But this category of like brain sort of like mushing, right? Like because the here's the issue, right? Root cause. What what's going on here? The person who wrote this web page was not expecting Ben Payne to come along and copy paste his text. That is the root cause, right? They didn't design the data structure to meet the needs of data scientists. Good news for employment. Nobody designed data. They put out a web page like this. Document and they, oh, aren't you? And you'll say, no, it is, it uses a computer to read things, which is a good thing because it makes you like invincible as far as like, I'm gonna run this on 10,000 computers. It also causes all these problems of like, you have to mess around with like columns of data and X and comments, right? Like, there's a trade off there. You get to do cool things that other people can't, but you have to do stupid things that other people don't have to do. So, there's a trade off. All right. So, other, other good bad news is that there's a NAN. NANs will show up the rest of all of your data sets, and I apologize, it's just the fact of life. You're gonna have to deal with it. Okay, so there's a good way of dealing with it. Um, so 
let's try some different games. So one thing I can do is I can multiply a thousand column by a thousand and then add that to the second column. So far so good. So we're gonna get back. Remember we had six. So we multiply seven times a thousand, add five five six, we got seven thousand five hundred and fifty six. We're good to go, right? Happy. Yes. All right. So let's see what happens there. Blah blah blah. When I add a nan to a number, I get back a nan. So my naive question. Oh yeah. So 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 the naive attempt here, right? Like I just want to multiply the thousands by a thousand and add to the hundreds place. I get a number back. It doesn't work. So that means this didn't work out. We're gonna have to try something way more complicated. So now the trick is, you've got this option that in each row, and now I'm going to apply that to all the rows. Okay, so it's going to go through, uh, and I'm applying it to all the rows, and it's going to apply that function. And so the end, I get back out the number that I added into the input, and then I'll go So, so far, so good, right? But it will be expected. If you look down at the bottom, it also works. Okay. You can throw them away, right? Exactly. Okay. So now we think happy days, we can make a plot. That's question. So what if the number is like 8063? Like 8 goes here. But if the um, I'm trying to find an example of what you're looking at. So I had eight zero and six three. Yeah. It's eight point zero. It's like eight thousand and. Let me pull up a little bit to the function that we're looking at. Okay, so so bit, I can't quite get this on the same frame, but. So we've got the, the function that we're going to apply. It's looking through here, and it says, is the value in the second column a NAN? If the answer is yes, only in the first column, because that is our hundredth place. If, it's not a, if it is not a NAN, that means a multiplication for it. Is that not sure whether I answered your question. Or not. Eight zero and eight zero six. Six. Yeah. Six. Zero. Yeah. And eight zero. Six. Right. So that's this was the way we show up in column one and column two is you have an eight, you have a six three zero, and down here you have an eight and six three. So when I multiply this times eight times a thousand plus Thirty. That is. Yeah, so that's the thing. Then we're going to turn into eight and a thousand plus three. Yeah. Yeah. Another question up here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. So. So you don't, the good news is you don't have to invent invincible solutions. You only have to work with the data you have. So, yeah. Yeah. This is saying apply this function to every row. There's x is zero and x is one. Right. So the, his point was, if you had a number like a hundred thousand, or sorry, a million, and it had like one comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero. We have a different problem, which is we have three things, and then almost all of them would be nans, right? And like so, it'd be a mess. 
And so, so the two answers that I guess. One is you only have to fix the problems you have because in this class we're working with static data. So that's a way easier problem because in some sense I know all the problems in this data, so I can solve all those problems. But I don't have to worry about new problems which might show up. You do have to worry about things you haven't seen before if you're working with data that changes. So suppose I have like, this is the monthly report on the bullying statistics that I get every month. I might not know what I'm going to see next month, but I'm going to have to develop slightly more robust code to handle cases I haven't seen before, or at least tell me hey, there's a case I haven't seen. So we're in this class, we're only working with static data, which means you only have to fix the problem data. Well, that's not true. We have static, we have a streaming data in one section, but don't worry about it. All right, so now we're going to go off, like this is, I'll probably have to put the rest of the lecture, the rest of this content into a video because uh, there's actually more, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to import a library called matplotlib. There's basically two big choices in Python. One is to use matplotlib and the other is to use Seaborn, which is commonly abbreviated as So matplotlib is where I spend almost all my time. And the reason for that is because matplotlib is a much more basic library. It has a lot of low -level commands. Seaborn has the advantage of being like fancy. It has like a bunch of things it does automatically for you. And sometimes that works out. But I'll spend most of my time in matplotlib because I want you to learn the fundamentals. I'm not saying you should never use Seaborn. You can certainly use Seaborn for your homework and your uh, project. But for most of this class, I'll be walking through matplotlib and I'm going to talk about all the fundamentals. Seaborn sort of wraps those up in Hizos, which is good news. It saves your work. It's a good thing. Um, but I'm going to teach you the fundamentals in matplotlib. Okay, so I've got the year, I've got the total column, plot the two, and we're good to go, right? Blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to use D frame and plot, so I've got the data broker, and I'm going to plot the minute, and I'm going to use X column, the year, total, and then I plot that, and I get this. And this, this, this makes me sad, right? Sad time. Right. right. <laughs> Plus, it's the year, right? Right. So let's 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 review this here. What is going on? Ah, oh boy. Right. Hmm. No. So the year that was an object. So this is the error model. The year was being read in as a string, and that's going to cause it to break. But I'm going to leave you in suspense. I'll post a video on the rest of this notebook because it's actually a little bit long, and I wanted to get you out of here on time. So okay. we'll come back to this in the video. And yeah, so we're going to skip over the tips. But I want to spend a little few minutes on visualization, and then we'll get to the data. So um, there's this guy, Tuff, who has um, things to say on visualizations. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of a tour of data viz analog. Wait, I'll get to it quickly. Okay, if you have okay, you have overweight. Alright, so I don't ignore that. So what this is is basically an inventory of every plot that it is reasonable to know about. Sorry, right? So <laughs> so let's look at the bubble chart because that's a thing that might be useful. Oh, here's the description of the bubble chart. Right? It's two axes and the bubbles of different size and different colors. So what does that mean, right? Okay, so okay, maybe that's related to a scatter plot. Let's go look at a scatter plot, right? So what am I doing here? I'm trying to build your mental inventory of all the things that are possible. It's really important to have that because it gives you creative. Creative means jumping around with things that you know about. So you have to know about what is available. So this is your building your mental library of of visualization tools. Can I go back. All right, so. The problem is, if you go back to the data viz catalog, there's like a huge number of, of things, right? Like we looked at that in the beginning. Right, so look at how many there are. That is a lot. It would be unreasonable for me to expect you to know which one to use in an appropriate context because you can't memorize all that. I've got the trick for you. Ready? Here's the trick. So there's a little flow chart which says, start here. What do you want to do? Do that. And it doesn't get much easier. It's spelled out for you. You can't get it wrong. If you follow this, you'll probably get a good grade. Right? Like this is pretty straightforward. 
So you don't even have to go back to that whole thing. It's like a, let's say a palette of things you could work with. This is like the straightforward thing to start with. And then if you're wondering, Ben, how do I know how to make this and, and, and map all this? Hmm, we've got a thing that we could do. We've got the name of it. And we've got a goal. All right. Also, there's a note outlining all of the, well, many of these um, in Pandas. So you can actually just walk through all those examples. They're posted in a notebook. Probably going to run over. I apologize. So static field, everything's done, nothing to learn, right? It's all, it's all there, right? Wrong. Even though it's years, we're making rapid advancements in data science and visualization. That's super exciting, right? The fact that even though this is a thousand year old project, we're still working on it and you can contribute. I mean, <laughs> that should be pretty exciting. All right. How do we do this? Well, data that it would overwhelm any normal library like Map.lib or Seaboard. Like I'll say I wanted to plot a data point for every person in the United States on a geographic map of the United States. That would be a lot of data, right? So there are special libraries that are being worked on, like data feeder, which sort of intelligently figure out how to render that data visually at the appropriate scale and density that doesn't kill your computer. An example. And there's a link to that. Okay. So there's other things. So like when I talk about map.lib, you're gonna have to specify I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. Okay, now make a plot. That's one plot is using a grammar of graphics, which is saying like Make a plot that has these features, and then you tell your computer, and it goes and does that, as long as you express it in the appropriate grammar. The translation or the hard part of describing the output you want and translating it into the commands that run, that's where the hard work is. Okay, so I'm going to start with these two. As I mentioned, I'm going to skip all this stuff. All right, you will, so for the assignment, you will need to read over these slides, but they're pretty straightforward to walk through. Blah, blah, blah. All right. Okay, we skipped over a lot, but it wasn't a lot of very density. So if you get stuck on the homework and it takes more than 30 minutes, that's where you stop and ask Ben. I think I got one email this week. So. All right, there's a video you can watch. It's not part of your assignment, but it's. Definitely. Okay, so the first assignment is to write a function and uh, it's going to be a string, and you're going to count the number of words and the number of characters. Gazes and no, yeah. Okay, that's straightforward. If this is boring and, and not very hard, and you're like, Ben, how do I grow? Here's a solution. You can do, you can do type um, checking. All right, next one. So it's a little more complicated in that you have to do um, some operations on a list, but it's just changing the order of things in the list. Okay. Again, it's a function specifying what list it is you have to transform. I'm saying you should write a function that takes a list and transforms it. So the way that I test out these homeworks, for example, is I send your function a string and then see if the function responds appropriately for the string that I sent it. Okay. So if I send the string, my name is Ben, then I should have a consistent count of words and characters for everybody's homework. Same thing here. If I send the same list to everybody's function, it should return the same return. Okay. And then the third one here is a, a pretty light introduction to pandas. So basically, um, you're going to transpose data in pandas, and you're going to load data in pandas. Okay, I think that's it. All right. So there's more. Like if, if that is boring to you, and you're like Ben, how do I grow? Here's some more. Okay. Break down your homework assignments. All right. One more thing before you go. So you got this piece of paper. Don't write your name on it. And 
because I don't know who you are, so I'm telling everybody the answer. We ask a question on here, and I say, I'll answer that question. What do you mean? If you have a question on there and you want an answer, that's how you will get it. You don't have to. I just want to know what is your feedback on Confusion. Yes. Yes. Well, you could say, like, also the class stuff or whatever. Like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I do read them. <laughs> But the intent is for this question. Uh, sorry for keeping you late. I try not to run over there. Everybody's definitions and word definitions are very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, anonymous. If you're worried, you can shuffle the anonymous thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I will. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And if I deferred your question to after class, it is now after class. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Ah, so let's go over terminal one. You can put your computer down. Okay, so now let's exit out of so like exit parentheses. I'll get you out of this. This is the Python. Uh, no, exit parentheses. Okay. okay, so now let's type ls. Yep. So the question is, where is that file? Is it on your desktop? Yeah. Okay, so cd base and then capital D desktop. And you can tab it all up. Okay, ls. That's a list of files in the file. Okay, so then you've got h.py there. So now you can type Python space h.py. Alright, so it says I'm not super happy. So let's go back to the h.py. So there is, so where did you get the h.py from? So, so I just Googled the like, um, text pad? Yeah, it's still text pad. Uh, I'm gonna, I don't know how to answer the question quickly for you, but I'm going to try and get you back to a. Uh, so let's go here. Save that. So now in my terminal. So I was able to get my sample work. I don't know why specifically h.py has some problems, but anyways, creating. So in here, I just went and created a text file. So we were able to figure out how to get text edit to make a plain text file. That's where this came from. But it still has some hidden character in there that. Apparently, quite unhappy with. I don't know the answer to that one. But for the sample one, 
I want to run that, I'll do it. Well, no, so LS is just saying what is in the current directory that I'm in. So you're right, and so there's another command, pwd. So pwd is like print working directory. So like, where am I? I'm in the desktop. And I can type ls and say, in the desktop, what are the files? Gotcha. And then you can say, OK, I see even the file that I want. Now I'm going to go with Python. And so the other fun thing is like, there's a tab completion. So. So I don't have a quick answer for H. Why being a problem, but <laughs> that's what I got. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Just for other people. I don't really. 